Robert Vimosi is a senior analyst at Makana. He's the author of When Gadgets Betray Us. He's an award-winning journalist and has been a security blogger for Forbes and a contributing editor for PC World magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Robert Vimosi. Good morning. So some of you may notice I did change the title of my talk, and if only to emphasize the urgency of some of the points that I want to make here today, I think it's a much more accurate title for my talk. So when I wrote When Gadgets Betray Us, I intended it to be a book for the mainstream audience. Uh, I knew about hardware hacking, but I don't think that a lot of people outside of the security community were really talking about it. And indeed, when I started writing the book in 2007, I was attending uh, Black Hat. I've been attending Black Hat since about 1999. And in 2007, I remember um, the founder, Jeff Moss, introducing a new track that was focused on hardware hacking. And it was based primarily on some of the work that had been going on uh, under Joe Grand, and, who spoke earlier this morning, and Chris uh, Tarnofsky, who's going to be speaking later this afternoon here in uh, Design West. And, they were talking about attacking gadgets. And to me, that was a really cool idea because I hadn't really thought of it. I had been looking at it from a software perspective. And what I had been doing was looking at viruses and worms that were attacking the PC. But when you start attacking a gadget, that's something totally different. So I wanted to write a book about that. And one of the things that I start with my, my book tour is by asking the audience, have you updated the firmware on your digital TV? Now, that's sort of a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that. Just something to hang in the back of your mind as I talk. Digital TVs have evolved from being something that just broadcasts entertainment to being little computers. And we're not yet making that transition, but it's true. They're connected to the internet now. And they're connected so that we can have these cool features like streaming Netflix, Netflix or Pandora or even Skype. And it makes it very convenient. And in my book, I talk about this weird dichotomy between convenience on the one hand and security on the other. And often they're at loggerheads. In order to have great security, you often sacrifice convenience. And in order to have convenience, you give up a lot of security. And I think there's a common ground in between. We're just not there yet. So, the company I work for, Makana, did a pen test of some digital TVs in December 2010. And what they found was that the TVs were really not protected very well from this thing called the internet that they were connecting to. That you could do a rogue DNS connection to it, and you could start to access things on it, namely the user interface screen. And what they found was that JavaScript was being used for that user interface screen. Well, OK, JavaScript has its pros and its cons. And when it's done right, it can be done very well. Unfortunately, when they did the pen test, they found that there were a lot of exposures. For example, here's the master password, and it was in the clear. So anybody who gained access to that TV could now gain access to the master password and could start to introduce new functionality to that TV. They could begin to enable things that the manufacturer had disabled. They could also look at the distribution keys for some of these services that I just named. Some of the TV manufacturers automatically enable these services as a feature that they offer in their TV. By buying this TV, you get Netflix. Great, wonderful. Well, they buy these volume license keys. If I can get in there and get this master password and get that distribution key, now I can start to watch these services for free. So we're talking about theft of services here. Now, also because it's JavaScript and I can inject code into it, I can also make it persistent. I can put it into the code so that when it's stored back in the NavRAM, and then every time it's rebooted and played back out, it will include my malicious code. So now I have a remote access on the TV here. So what's going on is that the code is not checking for integrity. It's not looking in its boot to see if anything new has been added, and it's certainly not authenticating any outside information. So when I talk about, did you update the firmware on your TV, I highly recommend it. Because shortly after the paper came out, a lot of the digital TV manufacturers got wise and started making some changes. So the date in which your TV was produced in a factory may be very different from the date that you bought it, and certainly not 2012. So I urge you to go and find a firmware update if there is one available for your TV. Now that comes as another problem. Not every gadget that we have 
has firmware updates being pushed out. Not all the vendors are doing that. One area where the vendors have been very good has been with printers. So in December of last year, two researchers at uh, Columbia University in New York reported that they had looked at the updates that were being pushed out by HP that went to their office jet printers. And what they reported was they were able to spoof those updates. In other words, they were not being authenticated. So they were able to spoof the update that was going out to a printer. And one of the things that they said that they could do was they could turn on the fuser. The fuser is the part of the laser printer that gets hot, and it basically um, dries the ink on the paper as it's going through the printer. And they said they could enable it so that it doesn't turn off. And this led to the famous headline that you see, uh, where people were saying that it caused HP laser printers to burst into flame. HP was a little slow with the uptake on this. It took them about 24 hours to issue a press release where they said, no, 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 that's not true. There's actually a thermostat in the fuser which would turn it off and prevent this from happening. But the real message was that other printers may in fact have this problem. The researchers weren't saying HP in particular, they were just starting to say this was one of the many things that they did. And in fact, the real message came out when they went to the Chaos Computing Convention or Congress in um, Berlin. And there, they actually said that with this HP printer update, they could, induce, uh, they could inject code that would allow them to gain a remote presence on the printer. Now, when you start to think about that, there are millions of these printers in our homes, in our home offices, in corporations all over the place. And so now, we're not looking at the perimeter anymore. We're not just saying we need a firewall on our PC or we need a firewall on our network. We got to worry about the peripherals. We got to worry about the printers because they're going to create problems for us if we don't. So, and also it raised the question, how do you trust an update? It's being pushed to your machine. We're kind of used to seeing that little toggle in the corner saying, do you want to uh, install that update? And we probably say yes, because in most cases that's a good thing, but that can also be spoofed. So how do we trust the update is another problem that we face. So you have a threat model, and when you're designing a system, you're operating under your company's threat model. You understand the risks that are uh, present for that device, and you design for it, hopefully. The problem is, is that the hackers don't really have a risk model that they're working off of, or a threat model. They're going in all directions, and they're looking at it outside the box. And that I encourage you to start thinking in those terms. When I was a reviewer for software at CNET, I had a internet security suite that I looked at. And one of the things that I discovered, because I was just basically hitting key commands, pulling down menus, doing whatever, was that a certain key command would open up the password manager without any password. And suddenly, in the clear, I could see all the passwords that had been entered into it. So I called up the, the vendor and I said, hey guys, you got a problem here. I can get into your password manager by doing this keystroke. And after an uncomfortable silence, the person at the other end of the phone said, but why would you do that? It didn't really matter why I did that. And the fact that I was cognizant of doing it and wrote down the key command was pretty amazing because it was pretty random that I did it. But chances are somebody somewhere else is going to do that same keystroke command and expose all of those passwords. The difference is, is that I was a software reviewer and I wanted to keep getting product from this vendor. I'm going to disclose it to them quietly and say, dude, you got to fix this before it goes public. And they did. But not everybody is ethical, and not everybody's going to do that. So responsible disclosure is very, very important, but you can't always trust the people on the other side to do responsible disclosure, and you are probably going to get burned at some point in time by somebody who's going to behave badly. So the thing with embedded security is that it's not perceived to be a threat yet. Uh, I work in a business where we talk about the Internet of Things. This is the internet that does not necessarily include the PC. It's everything other than the PC. So it's all these gadgets that are in the field for SCADA systems, in the medical facilities and hospitals, that are in our homes that connect to the internet, but we don't yet think of them as being computers. I mean, look at the smartphone. They're basically a new form factor of computer, but we don't think of them in those ways. We still refer to them as a phone. 
but they're really little computers. So until we start thinking of the digital TV, and still we start thinking of our printer as having computer capabilities, we're not going to be on board with this. Hence, there's a perception of no threat to the embedded security space. There's a talent gap as a result. The thing about embedded security is I don't necessarily need to get a certification in Microsoft or Windows or in Apple iOS. And suddenly, I know everything about those problems and everything. With embedded security, there's an operating system. And then there's a bunch of chipsets that you've got to learn. And they're all unique and different. And in some cases, there isn't even an operating system. You're just talking about chipsets and so forth. So it's very specialized. And there's a talent gap. People aren't yet focusing on the security aspects of embedded systems the way they should. And all of a sudden, customers are beginning to come to your company and say, hey, I read about that printer hack. What about me? Am I vulnerable? And you need to have an answer for that. And you need to be saying, we're on top of that. We're watching out for you. We're going to take care of it. And there's no standard approaches. Because you've got all these different chipsets, because you have all these different flavors and varieties and form factors and whatnot, it's not a one-size cookie cutter solution. Nor can you port the existing solutions from the PC world. You can't necessarily take the firewall and stick it into an embedded system. You can't take a malware protection service and move it into an embedded system. There are a lot of reasons why you can't do that. And I think there are new solutions out there, and they need to be found. So, I talk about a conspiracy of silence in that not a lot of companies want to admit that this is the case. My company, Makana, and EE Times did a survey last summer, and they approached 800 uh, embedded sec uh, system security people, and they asked them a few questions about security, and one of the responses was 25% of them said that they knew of vulnerabilities with their own products, but their companies had not yet disclosed nor had your companies started to work on solutions for that. That's 25% that admitted that they knew that there were flaws. And there's this perception of, you know, see no evil, speak no evil, we're not going to address it, la, 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 maybe it'll just go away on its own, maybe nobody's going to notice it. But then, you know, there's that reviewer at CNET that's going to punch every keyboard command possible and uncover that random code that opened something that I shouldn't have opened. So, that thinking outside the box is going to catch these people at some point, and you don't want to be in that position. The other thing is, is that the people that do know that there's a problem say that, hey, only 39% of them have access to the resources that they need to solve the problems that they find. That means that there's not really a security infrastructure in a lot of these companies. A lot of these companies have operated for many, many years successfully without a security component. And now they're getting caught up. They're getting caught up because they're taking their components that they've always done and they're connecting them to the internet. And it's only going to get worse. When we start really moving to IPv6, the next generation of the internet, everything's going to have an IP address. And in my book, I joke about the internet-connected toaster. And it, it may sound funny, but this is a serious problem. When we start connecting everything to the internet, it becomes possible for somebody to happen upon the IP address of a vulnerable toaster out there. And maybe they can use that to get into your home network. Maybe they can do something. Maybe they can just burn your toast. So the three common excuses that I hear back from the vendors when I talk to them about security problems are the following. One. It requires the resources of a nation state to exploit. Well, 10 years ago, that may have been true. It may have taken a lot of expensive and sophisticated equipment to take apart something. But today, it's a lot different. And I'm going to show you some examples of how a well-endowed academic team can do the type of research that I'm talking about. And even individuals can do it. Which leads me to the second response, requires uh, elite programming skills. And that may be true. In order to understand what's really going on under the hood, you probably do need a lot of you know, sophistication in your programming chops to understand what's going on. But you know what? It also is very easy to throw garbage code out there and totally crash it. And that's really what I'm after. I'm after a denial of service. I'm not necessarily after owning the device such that I can make it do all sorts of cool things. If it's you know, a heart defibrillator, I might just want to crash it and have the catastrophic results that come with that. And then finally, why attack this? 
Okay, there are a lot of gadgets. And in my book, I talk about things that are in your home or in your office that you may not think of as potential threats, but there have been real world attacks against them. One of the things I tried to do was not talk about theoretical attacks, but base it on real world attacks that I have seen demonstrated at security shows such as Black Hat, DEF CON, RSA, a bunch of different shows I've attended over the last few years. These researchers have demonstrated and I've actually seen the devices break. So, Anything is capable of being broken, anything. So I start the book off with Radko Susik. He is not a hacker. He is not anybody that's well-versed in the computing skills or anything. He's a street thug. And basically, his claim to fame is that he steals cars. And at the age of 11, in Prague, Czech Republic, where he grew up, he would use dime store scissors to cut the wires on Italian sports cars and hotwire them so that he could steal them. In his 30s, he graduated to using a laptop. And when he was arrested in 2006, he was charged with stealing 150 luxury cars off the streets of Prague using his laptop. Now, how he was able to do that is pretty clever. So a lot of us have the remote access um, keyless key fobs that get us into our car, and now you actually have uh, the capability of starting the engine with these key fobs, basically just having it on your person and pushing a button. A vast majority of these are 64-bit encryption based. And with 64-bit encryption, you're actually talking about a key space of over a trillion. So from an auto perspective, if I'm in the automotive industry, wow, a trillion. That's still a lot for somebody to brute force. If I take a laptop, a super fast laptop, it's going to take me days to crunch all of those numbers to find the key that's going to let me into the car, let alone start the ignition. Well, it turns out it isn't the case. The auto industry decided, we're going to break that up into digestible little chunks. So we're not talking about a trillion. We're talking about Mercedes, Ford, Toyota, et cetera, et cetera. And once you identify the key space for a given manufacturer, it is possible then to brute force just that key space. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Radko Susik. Somebody in a criminal organization figured this out and authored some software that they put up on the internet and he downloaded onto his stolen laptop. And now he's out on the streets looking for BMWs and he's able to get into them. So the auto industry comes back and says, great. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do code hopping. So we're not going to go in order. We're not going to take the keys as they are logically produced, but we're going to skip around. And that skipping can be identified through an algorithm because basically the car and your key fob have to agree. The car has to know what the next code is going to be. So there has to be an algorithm in there that tells the car to generate this particular code as opposed to that. And so by getting enough successful keys onto your laptop, you're able to find that pattern for that given manufacturer. And with that, you can then go and steal the cars. Hence, the 150 successful keys that were found on Radko Susik's laptop. He needed those in order to do the code hopping sequence. So that's what I was saying there. You just need a few codes to do that. We move from stealing a car to doing something far more interesting. The modern car today has, on average, 70 different discrete electrical systems in it. And these are very diverse, whether they're doing the anti-lock brakes or controlling the lights or the infotainment system that you have. Uh, they, they all have their individual tasks that they do. The thing about a car is that this evolved randomly over time. There wasn't an operating system. There wasn't a bed. There wasn't a common base or platform. It just evolved over time. And component manufacturers said, I can do this, I can do that. And so what links them all together are various buses. And so if you can figure out how to get in there, you can start to do some damage. And so researchers from um, the University of California, San Diego, and University of Washington got together and they started to focus their research around this RS-232 port, which is under the steering column of all cars produced in the United States after the year 2000. This was a federally mandated decision because the auto manufacturers, dealerships, had a monopoly on the computer systems in the car, and only they could access the information. But by making this RS-232 port available, any auto mechanic now can stick their diagnostic device in there and read back the error 
codes on the car. So it opened the playing field for the mechanics, but it also invited other people in, such as somebody with an evil intent. Now, this requires access to the car. So the scenario here would be somebody who's a valet at a very high-end parking lot or hotel, and they would have physical access to the car for a short period of time. They could stick something in there that would manipulate the car's electronic system or perhaps even a tracking device if they wanted to. But nonetheless, if they had physical access to the car, they could get into it. What the researchers showed in this photograph here is that they had a laptop connected to it, but then that laptop had wireless capability. And what they did was very interesting. The car here is, is in park. It's not going anywhere. But in an um, airport runway in Tacoma, Washington, they were able to drive the car. And more to the point, they were able to drive the car in parallel with another car. And so they were able to radio communications to the car with the laptop with the RS-232 port and communicate with it while it was driving. So there's a bunch of different scenarios that could happen here. One of which, it could be late at night, and you could have a situation where somebody is driving in the dark, and they have all their lights on, and suddenly all the lights in the car go out because someone has just hacked into the car driving alongside them. That's not only dangerous for the driver of the car, who is very clearly the victim, it's dangerous for all the other cars on the roadway because if we're talking about highway speeds. It's kind of incredible that the car would allow any sort of update or change in commands while it's in operation, but that's, that's just the way it is. So this also opens up a question about can you do a pure wireless thing? If, if we have a laptop plugged into the RS-232, obviously the car has been compromised in some way, but what about a car that hasn't been compromised? Well, there's, there's the tire pressure safety monitor, TPSM, that is in the wheel, the actual tire itself, and it's spinning around at several thousand RPM. You can't wire that into the car, obviously, because it needs to report whether the tire pressure is safe enough, and if it's not, a little light on the dashboard goes on. So that's a wireless signal. So these researchers were able to compromise that signal. And what they were able to do was they were able to turn on and off the dashboard light for the TPSM. And that's a small entry point. But nonetheless, they felt that with a little more research, they could use that to then get into other areas of the car. And what they could find by just simply fuzzing, not using sophisticated computer skills, but just throwing random code at the car, they could fire individual brake components. So instead of the brakes working in tandem, the brakes would now operate separately. So the driver front um, uh, tire brake would engage when the other ones would not. And that would be a very dangerous scenario. The other thing that they could do was they could inject software into the car, malware into the car. And now the car would be compromised with a virus. And one of the things that they were able to demonstrate was Here's a speedometer, and it's showing 140 miles per hour. The only problem is, is that the car is still in park. So this might be funny. This might be, haha, just a little hack that somebody did. But if you could depress the actual speed of the car by, say, 10 or 20 miles per hour, and the person was out driving, yeah, the person would probably get a ticket for speeding, but that person could also be endangering other people on the road. So it goes back to this issue of trust. You know, why is the car trusting this update that's being forced upon it? Why isn't there more authentication going on with the code that's being injected into it? Why isn't there integrity checks going on to make sure that no new code has been inserted into the car since the last time they was turned on? So there's collateral damage. I talked about the brake component being compromised. If that happens, who's going to get blamed for that? Is it going to be the manufacturer or the brake component? I think we already know the answer to that, and that is the automaker is going to get blamed for it. We saw some of this in 2009, or sorry, 2010, when Toyota made headlines for having issues with its brake and accelerators in Toyota Priuses. And for a long time, it was suspected that it was a software glitch, and it made the headlines that, in fact, it was a software glitch. But through extensive forensics, Toyota managed to clear themselves by showing that it was actually operator error and not electrical that was causing the problem. Nonetheless, sales of Toyotas plummeted in the summer of 2010 as the result of the bad media. So 
It's to protect the companies that you work for that you want to keep the name out of the headlines in that context. You want to make sure that there's security going in at the beginning and not discovered after the fact later that it should have been there all along. So this is kind of like a Stuxnet attack. Stuxnet was a worm that was targeted at the centrifuges in Iran for their nuclear facilities. And it started out as a simple virus on a USB. And it was plugged in um, to a Windows computer and taking advantage of a Windows vulnerability became resident. Now it didn't do anything on the Windows computer. In fact, that was just you know, sort of a Trojan horse. It was unnecessary, but it was there. And it waited until that Windows laptop or desktop connected to a Siemens System 7 PLC system. And then the payload executed. And that's when it started doing wonky things with the centrifuges. Now, who do you think got blamed for that? It comes back to people associate it with Siemens. And it really was kind of unfair. What was really going on was a maturation of the virus process. It used to be that um, you had to have a very broad playing field. Hence, they would go after Windows and find a vulnerability in Windows to infect a lot of different people. And in the last few years, that's really flipped around. And now we see the virus writers targeting very specific enterprises, very specific businesses, very specific systems. And this was one of the first times that a PLC system had been targeted. And this was also one of the first times that a real-world manifestation of a computer virus attack occurred. And that really has people scared because you have these niche programming codes for embedded systems and, and others that are out there. If those people decide to become malicious, we're in trouble because now this expectation, this perception of threat isn't true anymore. It's the fact that these systems are now targeted and that there's expertise in that particular area. So the auto industry, I think, is leading by a good example here. They're not sitting back passively and waiting for this to happen. They're actually getting together, and they've called Dr. Stephen Savage from the University of uh, California, San Diego, and his team with the University of Washington to do more research for them. And so we're talking about Ford and Toyota and the NTSB and a bunch of people sitting down together and saying, how real is this problem and what things can you discover? And in November, these guys presented something that I think is really clever, and that is an MP3 file can be compromised. That's not news. We've, we've seen this before in the virus world on our PCs. There's a lot of blank spaces in media files, and you can fill those blank spaces with malware if you're very clever. So what they were able to do, however, was to create a compromised MP3 file that could be downloaded off the internet, put on an iPod, and then broadcast into an infotainment system on a car and infect the car. So now we could have a viral attack against specific types of cars if we don't do something about it. So I think this is really cool that the automotive industry has taken it serious enough that they've invited the researchers in and they're actually listening to some of them before we start to see regulation from the government. This is something that the industry has chosen to do on its own and before consumers start pressuring to do it. Now I talk about that nation state argument that I think is not very true. Here's a great example. This guy is Jay Radcliffe, and last summer, on his own, working nights and weekends, he was able to compromise the insulin pump that he actually uses. He's a type 1 diabetic. Um, and I should also disclaim that he's uh, now a co-worker of mine at Makana. But at the time, he was working on his own, and as you can see on the table there, there's some parts that he purchased from Radio Shack in order to basically intercept the, the signal from the glucose meter and the insulin pump and the communications between them. And what he found, not too surprising actually, there was no authentication going on between the two, basically. And there was unencrypted communications between them, so he could eavesdrop upon that. And there was no notification that he was updating any of this stuff. So as he was compromising and configuring it differently and doing different things, there were no beeps or warnings or anything or nothing out of the usual to alarm him that something had changed with something that he depends on. Because one of the points he made in his Black Hat and DEF CON presentation last summer was that with insulin, it's not very easy to back out an overdose or an underdose. 
Uh, you're talking about a human, as he called it, a human SCADA system. And when pressure rises or when it lowers, you don't have release valves in the human body. So this is pretty serious stuff. And for him to be able to compromise it, not a good thing. And then there was no data encryption for the data at rest. And that's important if you're tracing back over the last 36 hours, how was your insulin, how was your glucose, et cetera, et cetera. He did not necessarily trust that data because it's not encrypted and someone could easily fudge that data. If you see in the corner there, that photograph shows that when he demonstrated this, he took pains to obscure the manufacturer of the insulin pump. And I'll, I mention that because he engaged in responsible disclosure. First of all, he consulted with the Electronic Frontier Foundation to seek legal advice as to how to go forward with this. And then he did not disclose the vendor name during the presentations. And he did not tell very much detail. He showed only enough code to convince us that it was possible. And he executed a live demonstration, not once, but three times during that period of time in Vegas that he was presenting. So he just gave enough to show you that it was possible to go on. And then um, after he did that, he started talking to the vendor directly. The vendor wasn't listening. The vendor didn't respond. So we had to engage the services of CERT and DHS to get them to understand that this really was a serious vulnerability. And he offered full disclosure of all the details of everything that he had done in exchange for cooperation. Silence again. Okay, so here's what they did say. They said, Thanks to the vendor's information security measures, we strongly believe it would be extremely difficult for a third party to wirelessly tamper with your insulin pump. Okay, that's sort of a safe press release for, for a company to issue when confronted with a disclosure like this. The only problem is, is that, you know, it, it did happen and we did all see that. So clearly the security measures in place failed and failed pretty massively. And then, um, this was a real-time on-stage demonstration. It wasn't like he, he talked about the code and whatever and didn't actually show it. We actually saw the symbol that said that it had crashed. And what it actually said was it had suspended operations. So then that, that goes on and they said, he also turned on the wireless feature and had access to specialized equipment which could be used to broadcast the RF signal in a controlled environment. Controlled environment? Have you ever seen a demonstration at DEF CON? It's pretty wild. Uh, you, I wouldn't call that a controlled environment. And in many cases, the presenters at Black Hat and DEF CON go on about how the demo gods are not smiling favorably upon them. And yet he did. He did it once at Black Hat. He did it again in the press room for my colleagues and such. And then he did it again at um, DEF CON 19. So he did it more than once and more to the point, this was something that he was wearing. This is his pump that he was actually living with. So it wasn't like a specialized piece of equipment that he rigged so that he could do this demonstration in front of everybody. Well, if he wasn't getting the attention of the company directly, he got the attention of the government. And so two Congress people got together and asked the GAO office to investigate, to find out what was going on, not just with this company's product, but with other companies' products, medical devices in general. There are a lot of recalls going on. And it only reaches a recall level when somebody gets caught. And I hate to say it that way, but the FDA requires medical device companies to report anytime somebody is injured, or dies as a result of a malfunction of a medical device. And a malfunction can be anything from a software glitch to an actual denial of service where it crashes. And this is reported on a website called MOD, which you can access. And any time a company gets caught, they have to disclose this. And if they don't, they get penalized by the FDA. And that's pretty serious stuff. So at this point now, the company, and I'll go ahead and say it, Medtronic, got very serious about it. And they started engaging security companies. They started working with the government. They get it now. They understand this is a big deal and it's not going to go away. So they're working on a solution. And I think it's interesting to watch this evolution because this small piece that you see here is part of a larger pattern, a pattern that I refer to. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. Before I do, I just want to tease a little bit more. Um, later this afternoon, you're going to hear from uh, Barnaby Jack if you go to the Black Hat track, and he's going to talk about how to do what Jay did locally 
Barnaby Jacks are going to talk about how to do it from across the room. Using an antenna, he can actually intercept the insulin pump signals and manipulate them from across the room. So this is an expansion of the attack that Jay did. Barnaby Jacks is going to show you how he can do it across the room. And I just want to reiterate, it's much better to have the white hat hackers do this than it is to have the black hat hackers do it first. OK, so I started to get into what I think is going on with a lot of these companies. And that is, I see it as the five stages of hacker grief. And it basically follows the five stages of death and dying. And that is, first of all, you get into denial and isolation. You begin to say, well, you know, it takes the resources of a nation state, or it takes you know, sophisticated programming skills to get this uh, accomplished. Well, that's not necessarily true, but that's what the companies say. Then they move into anger. Anger can result in lawsuits. Anger can result in accusations going back and forth. They can even disparage the integrity of the researcher. Whatever. They get angry. And then they get into bargaining. Bargaining is when they need to start like, cleaning up their act. They realize this is serious, and they need to start doing something. So they're going to bargain with you. And then there's depression. Even with the bargaining, something fails. And you bottom out. And it's from there that they rise, and you get acceptance, and the company goes forward and survives. So I think Sony, best examples, all five of these in recent memory. One year ago at this time, the Sony PlayStation 3 was hacked. And it was this guy right here, uh, George Francis Hotz, AKA GeoHot. And he did this very publicly. Sony had come out with the PlayStation 3 in November of 2010, and they were talking about how secure it was. Well, they're in the gaming industry, and yeah, they need to make it secure, because there's going to be theft of service if there's not. People are going to try to play their games for free, and Sony's going to lose out. So yeah, there is security. And what they had was a public-private key going on there, so that when they passed out, passed out firmware updates, it would be authenticated. And that seemed to be fine and everything. Well, George here. This is the guy who first um, jailbroke an iPhone after Apple said that was impossible to do. He did it. So he turned his attention to the PlayStation. You said it couldn't be done. He's going to try to do it. And so he actually live blogged what it was he was doing. Sony wasn't paying attention. Or if they were, they weren't really calling attention to the fact that this guy was out there. And they basically ignored him. So there was denial and isolation going on here. So George did. He cracked the private key. And not only did he crack the private key, he published it. He published it on the internet. And well, what do you think is going to happen with that? Sure enough, Sony turned around and sued him. They got angry. They said, you can't do that. So George decided to push the envelope a little bit. He authored a rap song, and he put it on YouTube. And so Sony turned around and said to Google, you got to give us the IP addresses of everybody who downloaded and watched that YouTube video. No, the cat's out of the bag, guys. The code is right here. It's like you can't retrieve something like that. Sorry, it doesn't happen. Well, this had an interesting side effect. First of all, Sony turned around and settled with, with George. So that was taken off the table. But because they were trying to sue the YouTube people from finding out that code, they angered a lot of different groups out there, one of which was anonymous, or people calling themselves anonymous. And they decided that Sony needed to be punished for their lack of security, and went after them with various denial of service attacks and data breaches, where they stole the card uh, numbers for the subscribers to various services. And they didn't just go in the gaming service, they also went into the motion picture and other aspects of Sony. So various components of the Sony empire were being attacked randomly by these groups of people that were angry. Everybody's angry at everybody else. Even though there was some bargaining going on, it really wasn't going away. And this continued for quite a while. It was quite embarrassing for Sony. So meanwhile, Hotz, he makes off pretty good. He goes over to Facebook now, and he's working over there. And then very recently, he just switched jobs. He's now working for Lady Gaga's new startup in Palo Alto called Backplane. So Sony bottoms out. They have to take their Sony network off. They have to take the PlayStation network offline. And they've got to re-architect a solution. When you're talking about something that's hard-coded, 
that's a problem. You can't go out and, and access all those 70 million devices easily. You've got to find a clever way to do it. And they did. It took them a couple weeks, and they brought the network back, but they basically took a huge hit, up to $1 billion in a hit for this. So it cost them a lot of money. And in, in reality, it's kind of unfair because, you know, they did have this pretense of security. They had a public-private key. They, they, they kind of boasted about it, and they kind of invited it. But nonetheless, nonetheless, somebody out there, like me, hitting the keyboard and trying to figure out a key command that's going to open up a password manager, George figured out what the private key was, and that embarrassed them. They, they should have been a little more aggressive about it. So today, they've remedied the situation. They now have a CISO. Okay, that's amazing. September 6, uh, 2011, they get their first CISO, CISO, for Sony. Let me restate that. This is the Sony Corporation. It was founded in 1946. It took them 65 years to get a CISO in the company. I, I think that this is representative of a lot of different companies. I mentioned Ford and Toyota. A lot of these companies have existed for many, many years, but not really in the security realm. And so they're caught off guard when a researcher or when anyone, a black hat, comes to them and says, I found a vulnerability in your system. They don't know how to respond. They don't have the infrastructure for it. And that is a huge problem. So I'm advocating that companies start thinking about having a security infrastructure now rather than later. So let's get back to this PlayStation attack. What was so big about it? I mean, 75 million PlayStations. They're games, right? They're toys. Well, actually, they're not. If you look at a gaming system, whether it be the PlayStation, the Wii, or uh, the Xbox, they're pretty sophisticated programming, uh, I'm sorry, uh, computational boxes when you look at it, because the graphics have to be rendered very quickly and with a lot of detail. The sound has to be done in real time and be, you know, Dolby and THX. So there's a lot of computational power in each one of these boxes. They're kind of like little Uber computers that are in our homes, and we sort of dismiss them as that game that the kid plays with in the corner. Well, maybe we shouldn't. When you get 75 million of them, and when you get the firmware, key out there, you can do something very clever, I think. And one of those things, and there are lots of different things you could do, but one of those things I think you could do is you could create a botnet. And now you've got a really powerful computational system out there that could be used to crunch, say, a key for an NSA encryption code, or maybe deconstruct your DNA if they were feeling philanthropic and wanted to help out humanity. So Sony had no choice. They really had to pull this offline, and they really had to fix the problem, because there could be problems that I can't even imagine, you can't even imagine. They just wanted to get it taken care of, and they did. So, Let's re reiterate what we've seen here. We've seen digital TVs, and we have def uh, theft of service going on with that. We have printers where we have you know, remote access to your network. You can get a nice little anchor there in a printer and survey the entire home network or office network. You have automotive attacks while the car is driving, and that can endanger the driver, if not other drivers on the road. And you have insulin pumps where you can have remote manipula uh, manipulation. And there you have, obviously, you know, the threat of death as well for the individual. And then PlayStations. You know, who knows what's possible if you owned all of these gaming uh, systems all at once. But these are the lucky companies. In the book and in the movie, The World According to Garp, there's a scene where Garp and his wife are looking at a house. And as they're doing so, a plane lowers and eventually crashes into the house. And the real estate agent turns to Garp and his wife and says, well, you probably won't be buying this house. And Garp smiles at his wife and says something to the effect, honey, it's perfect. It's been pre-disastered. And so I look at all of these companies that I've just uh, done the case studies for, and I'm saying they're actually lucky because they have gone through some hacking experiences and have come out the other end, or, in the or they're in the process of coming out the other end. It's unclear about some of them, but I think they'll, you know, the prognosis is good. They probably will figure it out. The problem is, is that the Internet of Things is very complex. So when we look at that tiny iceberg there, that iceberg represents PCs in millions of dollars from the years 2009 to 2013. That's the chunk that's PCs, and we're pretty good 
at securing those PCs. We have firewalls, we have internet security suites, we have a lot of the features on there to keep them secure. But look at this other iceberg, the bigger one. The very top are the mobile phones, and there's been a lot of discussion here and elsewhere about the security of mobile phones, and I haven't yet talked about mobile phones, and I'm not going to actually, because I want to keep the focus on what's below the waterline. What's below the waterline are all the gadgets that I talk about in my book, all the gadgets that are in the military, that are in our utilities space, that are in our medical space. These are gadgets that are being connected to the internet without a lot of care about their internal security. And they're huge. I mean, that iceberg is much, much bigger than what we're seeing. So the attacks that we're seeing today are, as they say, just the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty more to come. So this is a huge threat landscape that we're talking about. And we need to start thinking today about what we're going to do to defend that. So the government is actually thinking about that. Government usually takes a while, but they're actually on top of it now. And in this case, they've got competing bills going up in, in Congress. And the one that I'm going to talk about, and I'm not advocating that it's better or worse than the others, just because this is the one that gets talked about the most, is the Cybersecurity Act of 2012. And one of the things it talks about is giving DHS the power to develop a risk performance requirement for each industry. So we'll at least start to get baselines out there as to what DHS considers a safe environment for each industry. Now, this is a step towards government regulation, but it's not without precedent. We've seen this before. This also allows the company to dispute whether they're not in compliance if the DHS declares that they are out of compliance. But that means the company's got to have the wherewithal to test themselves. And if they don't, they're going to need to hire third parties. So this is going to create a whole new cottage industry of auditors that will be able to come in and certify your business. And if this sounds familiar, it should be, because PCI has been doing this with the credit card industry. Basically, the top five credit card processors have banded together and come up with a baseline of 12 requirements, 250 sub-requirements, that they insist that anybody who handles their cards must follow, or you're out of compliance. And this means the the merchant who takes your credit card and swipes it all the way up to the processor who hands the processing over to the bank, the acquirer, for payment. So it has a precedent and it possibly could work in a variety of vertical spaces, the utility space, the medical space, communication space. So we'll see if that's the case. And like PCI, this um, Cybersecurity Act also allows you to self-certify. So you don't necessarily have to bring in a third party. You can attest to whether you are meeting their compliance uh, regulations or requirements. So I think this is a great first step. Whether this actually becomes law is arguable, but it's something that's going to happen. And if you don't like the government doing this, then band together as your respective industries and come up with your own security baselines and make that the requirement that everybody follows. So with Embedded systems, we have some special interests uh, to, to consider here. It's not um, like a PC, which is fairly homogenous uh, from unit to unit, and you can overlay an operating system, which again, you know, is fairly homogenous. It's a lot of specif uh, specific things. And one of the things you want to consider, of course, is the design impact. When you start layering in encryption, that's going to retard the performance a little bit. You need to find a way to do that so that it doesn't impact the performance of the device. In a lot of cases, the gadgets that we're talking about are really tiny, and so we don't have a lot of extra you know, battery, and we don't have a lot of resources to commit to the security. So how are we going to do that? So here's a space where we need to get creative and start thinking outside the box. And then implementing the security. This is something that's probably not in your software development life cycle right now, but it should be. And if you don't have a software development life cycle, you probably should. And then lastly, there's going to be compliance, whether we like it or not. It's either going to come from the government, it's going to come from your industry, or it's going to come from the consumers themselves saying, why aren't you trustworthy? I mean, we saw with Toyota the hint of any electrical problem with their hybrid electronic car, and all of a sudden the sales tank. So people are skittish when it comes to these things. You want to earn their trust by not having these events. So what now? In the short term, I think there will be some pain and suffering. 
I, I think it's just going to happen because we're kind of caught off guard. With the PC industry, we had 20 years to basically come up to speed, and we lived with spamming and malware and so forth, but it wasn't costing human lives. I think in the short term, we're going to see blackouts. We're going to see some catastrophic failures of gadgets that we depend on, and that's hopefully in a very short window of time because I'm here today to say that we should start changing that mindset and start thinking defensively. Everything that we build, every device that we create, we got to think, how can somebody break it? And I don't think we're doing enough of that right now. So you can avoid the pain. As I said, there is a roadmap. There are precedents out there, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. And to convince your higher ups in the company that this is necessary, tell them that once you get through this short term pain, it can be very, very good. Look at some of those companies that I mentioned that survived hacking. They're actually in a fairly good space compared to their competitors who haven't been attacked, who probably don't have the security infrastructure yet. So how do we update the Internet of Things? As I mentioned before, did you do the firmware up uh, update of your uh, digital TV? I, I, probably you haven't, because you weren't aware about it necessarily. How do we get that out there? I mean, in the security community, I'm not even good at, with doing it. And so how do we communicate that to our parents, to people that aren't necessarily savvy with computers, or a generation removed from the generations that are savvy with computers? How do we make it easy for people to update the gadgets? All they want to do is bring it home, rip open the box, and start enjoying their cool new gadget. I do, and that's what I do, but I want the security to be there. So how do I know that that's going to happen? We need to solve that problem. The other thing is, is that embedded systems are different from software. You can't just push out a, an update to everybody so easily. And who will be providing that update? Well, think about durable goods. If I have an internet-connected washing machine, it's going to last me probably 10 or 15 years. A lot can happen in 10 or 15 years. I guess flip that around. Would you take a Windows 95 box and hook it up to the internet today? No. It's going to get owned in seconds. So we're going to be in a similar state where we've got durable goods connecting to the internet, and they're not going to be updated regularly because the companies that produce them probably aren't going to be interested in keeping them up to date with patches. And we need to solve that. Perhaps building a robust device from the outset is the way to do that, so we're not constantly patching it. Ford is thinking outside the box. I mentioned the auto industry earlier. Here's a concrete example. They worked with Microsoft to develop the Sync infotainment system for their cars. And they've got about 30,000 or more cars out there with generation one of the Sync system. Guess what? There are some bugs with it. They want to fix it. So in the past, the auto industry has done something along the lines of a recall. Recall is a pain in the neck because you've got to schedule time with the dealer, you've got to go there, you've got to sit around, and chances are it's only going to take five to ten minutes to do this update of the sync system. So who's going to do that? Not a very good solution. Ford came up with something very creative. They have a website that you log into if you're a sync owner, and you download onto a USB device the update for the sync system, sync version 2, to make it something that you want to do, they've added new features. So they're touting the fact that with version 2.0, you get these new features. Go ahead and do this. They're not really talking about the security or bug fixes, which is clever, but OK, fine. So then you take this USB, you take it out to your car, you plug it into the car, and the screen walks you through the process. And it's about a five or 10 minute process. And you can go to YouTube and watch a video to see how this is done. Here's the part that I don't like. It requires the user to complete the task. Now, that may sound trivial. Actually, it completes it and says, complete it on the dashboard of your car. You have to take the USB and go back to your computer and plug it into the computer and upload to Ford the successful results of your, your update. And I think that step is a little clunky and maybe a problem. I don't think they're going to see exactly how many of these cars got updated, because I don't think everybody's going to follow through with that last step. They're going to see the notice on their dashboard, and they're going to move on to something else. Because frankly, it takes a lot of time to do this, and people are busy. I get it. But we have, like I said, a roadmap. And the roadmap is the software industry. We had 20 years to map out how to resolve the problems with viruses and malware. And we did. And a lot of it came down to the code that was created a long time ago. So in the 1990s, you had all these new computers going out there. 
not much to do with them. So by writing buggy code, we got a lot of code out there, but then we paid the price for it. There were a lot of buffer overflows. There was a lot of copy and paste going on. It, it just was very, very sloppy. And so we needed to codify the process of software development. And we needed to get software security introduced into the programming classes. It was one thing to teach C++, but it was another thing to introduce the security aspects of that the coding process. Security was often somebody else's job. So Microsoft engaged in the five stages of grief. So in the 1990s, they were kind of in denial. You would call them up and say, what are you doing about Outlook? And why is my Outlook infected with this virus and everything? And be like, it's not Outlook's problem. It's the file that you downloaded. It's someone else's problem. There was a lot of denial going on initially. And then in 1999, David L. Smith authored a virus called Melissa. He named it after a stripper that he had met in New Jersey. And it sent out pornographic URLs in a Word doc. It, it basically compromised a, a dot .doc. And that spread around and shut down email servers. OK, if that wasn't bad enough, the very next year, two Filipino students authored I Love You, which was a worm that spread around the world in five hours. It infected email servers all around the world, five hours. So if these weren't wake-up calls, I don't know what was. So Microsoft turns around and spends two years pushing out fa faster patches and updates. Good. This is great. The problem is the updates and patches came at random times. You didn't necessarily know when it would happen, and it was hard to communicate that you needed this update in order to block the latest malware that was going on. So. They thought they had it under control, and then there was MS Blaster. MS Blaster was a case where um, Windows XP and Windows 2000 devices were infected with um, an RPC vulnerability. And CNN happened to be running Windows 2000, and they were one of the first people to get this virus. And they called me up, and I didn't even know what it was because I hadn't heard anything about it. Nobody was talking about it. And it was there on CNN. Everybody was suddenly talking about MS Blaster, and it became a huge black eye for Microsoft. So they had to do something, and they did. In 2004, they standardized Patch Tuesday. Every second Tuesday of the month, you can expect patches. And more to the point, it was on Tuesday so that you could system test and make sure that it wasn't going to crash your system on Friday or Saturday. You could basically gain control. They did something else, too. They offered a bounty program. They offered a quarter of a million dollars to anybody who turned in a virus writer. And this paid off because in 2004, there was the Netsky virus. And it was written by 16-year-old Sven Yashin in Germany. Ironically, he was not too far away from his dad's computer repair shop when he wrote the code. And he was sending out updates and variations of it. And his classmates knew it. And they turned him in and claimed the quarter million dollar prize for turning in Sven. And that, I think, was the beginning of the end of some of these high-profile malware that we were seeing in the early part of the 2000s. Today, we laugh about this trustworthy computing thing, but I really do think it was a turning point. Microsoft stopped cutting and pasting code. They started checking in the code every time they made new iterations. It greatly slowed down Windows Vista, and they end up dumping a lot of features, which made it into Windows 7. But the end result is we have a safer operating system from Microsoft today than we would have had this memo not been created in 2001. And today, Microsoft is a fairly successful business. Now, for us in the embedded security space, we have some challenges ahead. For example, if we can't get people to download the firmware updates, what about over the air? I mean, we have secure communications. Maybe we should be exploring ways that we could push out the updates when necessary. And I know that brings up other issues. What about conflicts and so forth? There, there may be some issues that you haven't tested for. You don't want the company just pushing out. But nonetheless, we need to explore that. There are other things that you can do. Digitally signing the updates. This would mitigate some of the problems that we saw with the HP printer and um, with the digital TVs as well. You can authenticate that the firmware update really is from the vendor. And then well, let's not forget about the chips themselves, OK? Moore's law can work into our defense. I cited earlier that you can use a laptop to steal a car. That's a case where Moore's law is working against us. The speed and processing and the costs are going down so that anybody can get these fast computers today. Let's rethink it. Let's put some more chips. I'm sorry, let's put some more transition, uh, transistors on the chip and dedicate those to security and make it so that the security domain is present in every single one of the chips. That's kind of thinking outside the box, and it might help us to secure these systems. 
And then finally, train yourself. I mean, train your staff as well. It, it doesn't cost that much to get certified in various programs. I'm a CISSP, and my company paid for it. I think it's great that companies will do that to educate their staff more as to what's going on in the world of security. There's a shortage of talent, and let's not contribute to it. So in summary, there's this perceived threat, which I'm arguing is actually real. And I've documented several cases here today that show you that it's real and it's happening, and there's many more in my book. There are targets that are all over the place. We're not necessarily thinking of all these gadgets in our lives as many computers, but we really do need to make that transition. People still talk about their mobile phones as a phone, but really, it's a small form factor computer. And then we have um, the hack companies themselves. Initially, we're laughing at them. Initially, they're struggling and they're in a lot of trouble. But I argue that in the end, they're better off because they are now putting in that security infrastructure and they'll actually benefit from it and they'll probably survive for a good long period of time. Look at Microsoft. And so you can avoid the pain. You can start down this path today. You don't have to wait until you are attacked. And you can create and follow a secure software roadmap. I mentioned that Microsoft had trustworthy computing. This has been codified and generic, made generic in the form of um, secure software development life cycles. And you can go to the internet. One of them is BSIM, which is Building Security and a Maturity Model, which is free. And it's a framework based on 30 different companies and the best practices that they use. And you can take that and you can adapt it to your specific circumstance and it would work in embedded security. And you can overcome the physical design challenges. As I mentioned, we can put more security into the individual chips themselves. We don't have to rely on an overarching, overarching security model. We can start building it in, literally baking it into the chip itself. And then lastly, start thinking outside the box. Hammer away at the keyboard, do various keystroke commands, break things. That's the only way we can fix them and get them to be better. So what can you do? Why wait for an attack? Act today. Don't blow this off until you're threatened or hacked. Take the lead. Thank you very much.